Hi, how's it going? Hello everyone. Not too long ago, I received a couple emails from someone offering to send me welders to review. The brand was Arc Captain. Emails like that are nothing new, and I declined as always. But there were things in the emails that intrigued me. In the first email, they said that they were confident their welders were better than Yes Welder, and in the second email, they also said that they would soon be bigger than Yes Welder. I didn't think all that much of it, but I did start seeing Arc Captain welders pop up on Amazon. Looking at their website, they have a pretty similar supposed origin story to nearly every other Chinese welder company. They have apparently been making cutting edge welders for industry for many years, and within the last couple years decided to start selling direct so they could make the most awesomest welders available to consumers. Basically that. And I've seen a remarkably similar story on the websites of several other welders like these. Either way, I decided to get a couple and give them a go. To be clear, these welders were not given to me. I purchased these myself from Amazon. This video will be a bit of a double feature. I'll be looking at what I think could be a good cheap home welder or a beginner welder, as well as a stick welder with some very questionable output specs. The company boldly claims in the ads and on their website that their welders are CSA certified, though they don't have any CSA markings on the boxes or on the welders, which would be very strange if they actually were CSA certified. They do print UL on the boxes and on the welders. I searched the UL listing database for the welders, the ARC captain name, the parent company name, and just about everything else I could think of. I couldn't find any UL listings for these machines. I emailed the person who originally contacted me and asked for info on the CSA certification or UL listings, and I haven't gotten a response yet. If I receive any evidence that these aren't made up claims, I'll post a pinned comment. After looking at the welders themselves, I'm pretty sure these are bogus claims. So let's talk about the welders, starting with the ARC 200 stick welder. This is the machine with the more questionable specs out of these two. It claims a 60% duty cycle at max output, which is a typical claim for these types of machines. It claims 200 amps of max output on both 240 and 120 volts. In no. I can't imagine anyone has a 120 volt circuit with a breaker large enough to actually do this, even if the machine could do it. I also can't imagine the welder's internals holding up to that for anywhere near the rated 60% duty cycle, not to mention the power switch, the power cord, etc. In fact, that might be a fun test someday. Run a welder like this, maxed out on 120 volts, using a sufficient power source and breaker that won't trip to see if it'll survive the duty cycle. I'll have to see if I can make that happen at some point. But for now, we'll simply test to see if it can even reach that output in the first place. The stick welder has what they call synergic mode, but that doesn't seem like the right term. In MIG welding, synergic mode means that as you adjust wire feed speed, the voltage will automatically adjust to match. Synergy. With stick welding, there's only an amperage setting, so there's nothing to synergize with. Ultimately on this welder, synergic mode just restricts the amperage range based on the electrode size you choose. The welder also supposedly has VRD, hot start, and anti-stick. It also claims to be able to run 6010, and there is a lift start TIG mode. We'll put all of that to the test shortly. Unfortunately, it includes the same, definitely not UL listed power cord adapter that many cheap machines include that sends 240 volts directly to a 120 volt rated plug. But they still emboss UL onto the core of the adapter. It also has the usual ANSI NEMA welder certification standard printed on the data tag, a certification that this welder absolutely couldn't pass. In my opinion, the MIG-130 is the more interesting machine of the two. I got this welder on sale for $152. Despite it being called a MIG welder, it is just a flux core welder. It cannot use solid wire with shielding gas, but it has stick and lift start TIG modes. As a cheap home welder for a beginner or something like that, it has potential. It is 120 volts only and it claims 130 amps of output. It will only fit four inch spools of wire, but that probably isn't a big deal for most people. The larger spools are a little bit better deal, you know, by weight than the smaller ones, 
but unless you're doing a ton of welding, it's not probably going to be a deal breaker for most people to have to buy the 4-inch spools. Neither welder comes with any accessories for TIG welding, but that's to be expected for the price. The accessories these machines do come with are extremely cheap. There is a copper-plated steel alligator clamp <laughs> for the flux core welder. The 200 amp stick welder comes with a nicer work clamp, but it's still pretty basic and it does have just copper plated steel jaws. Both come with cheap electrode holders with just copper plated steel jaws. Both welders also have really thin aluminum cables with, you know, kind of soft, easy to melt, very stinky insulation. The cables are also relatively thin. Even the supposedly 200 amp stick welder includes cables that are just six gauge. The insulation is fairly thick, so I cut a little bit of it back so you can see just how thin the cables are on these welders. And the cables are copper clad aluminum, not actually copper conductors. They will probably get the job done for small projects at lower amperage with these machines, but if this welder really can put out 200 amps at a duty cycle of 60%, these welding cables would probably melt their insulation off if you ran them that hard. None of this stuff is too surprising or unusual for the price, but after their boasting, it would have been nice to at least see better cables and a less dangerous 240 volt adapter setup. The FluxCore machine uses common contact tips that you can get just about anywhere. It also includes a two pound roll of FluxCore wire, so that is what I will start with. If it doesn't run well, I'll try something else just to make sure that it's the wire and not the machine. Before we start welding, let's open these up and see what they look like inside. Inside the welder, both of these machines are relatively simple, but they're pretty neat and tidy as far as the way they're put together. Both machines have generous applications of silicone around things like small transformers and capacitors and things like that to um, sort of mitigate vibration or any kind of damage because of you know movement of components so that's kind of nice to see. Both of them have semi-enclosed areas around the heat sinks and honestly from this view you can pretty much see all there is to see on both of these welders. The back sides of these boards have no components on them there's just you know some through hole uh, pins sticking through and that's pretty much it. Underneath these uh, plastic shields here all there are on either of these welders uh, a couple of resistors and then just the heat sinks with the diodes, rectifiers, and IGBTs connected to them. So there's really nothing underneath these, uh, these covers either. So like I said, not really a whole lot to see. Very, very simple setups. A couple things to note, both of them just have the ground wire coming in and screwing onto a spot on the casement. So there aren't additional ground jumpers to go between the different panels or to the outer case or anything, but they do at least take the time to have a paint-free spot everywhere there is a connection point. And even these side panels where they bolt on, on, on both welders, you can see they've gone through the effort of leaving paint-free spots on not only the inner frame, but also uh, matching inside on the... Uh, the panels that go on there so that you do get um, you know a good metal to metal transfer for the ground so it's not the, the best ground setup I've seen but they've gone to a little bit more effort than some of the welders I've seen. I do wish they had some type of plastic or insulation on the back side of the boards on both of these welders particularly on the stick welder just because it can run at 240 volts so these terminals could have up to 240 volts or more on them and they're not all that far from the case and um, you know it's a big open area for that case it could get bent in against the board on this one it's a much smaller span because of these smaller span these smaller panels so it would take a lot more force to actually bend that in far enough to hit the board and this is only a 120 volt machine so maybe not as big of a deal on this machine but i do kind of wish this one at least had some kind of shield in the back and with that let's get them back together and do some welding Starting with the MiG-130, I found that it runs pretty good with one quirk. Unless you maintain a short contact tip to work distance, the arc will fluctuate quite a bit. If you keep the contact tip really close to the weld, it smooths right out and runs pretty good, even with the included wire. Something I noticed even before I started welding and found this little quirk is that the contact tip is recessed surprisingly far up in the nozzle, probably around a quarter of an inch. 
Since the nozzle isn't needed for flux core and it likes a close contact tip to work distance, I found it easiest to just run with the nozzle removed. You could grind down the nozzle a bit if you really wanted to use it, and also the included contact tips are rather short. I found that the Lincoln brand contact tips I have on hand from Home Depot were slightly longer and made it easier to avoid that arc pulsing with the nozzle in place. I also believe I've seen contact tips from other brands that are even slightly longer than the Lincoln tips, so that might be an option as well, but personally I would just run without the nozzle rather than searching out specific contact tips. Either way, when you keep the stick out short, it runs smooth. Maxed out with the included O30 flux core wire, it can basically put out the claimed 130 amps at around 20 volts. It can also adjust down to 40 amps or so for welding fin material. So it can weld flux core, but it can also stick weld. It doesn't have quite the claimed stick output. It has around 115 amps, give or take, not the claimed 130 or the 130 that it shows on the display. It will run a 1 8 inch rod, but a 1 8 inch 7018 is a bit tough to start and runs on the cold side. When maxed out, the machine draws around 40 amps from the wall. It will run a 3 inch 7018 just fine at around 85 to 90 amps. It's not the easiest starting stick welder, but the arc is smooth and the output is enough to run any 3 32 inch rod plenty hot. And if you connect a TIG torch with a valve and a tank of argon, it has a true lift start TIG mode. Like stick mode, it doesn't reach 130 amps, maxing out instead at around 118. So it wouldn't be good for much over 1 8 of an inch or so, depending on the situation. But the lift start mode is easy and it works well enough. As with many of my reviews, this is a sample size of one and based on relatively short term use, not years of use and abuse. So I can't say how it will hold up over the long term. But out of the box, this is an okay flux core welder that offers versatility of stick welding as well as a stepping stone into the world of TIG welding if you wanted to pick up a TIG torch, regulator, and an argon tank down the road. And that's not something you normally get for this price. But just be aware that the price does mean that there are some quirks and build quality concessions. As for the ARC 200, I was not at all surprised by the results. It does not have 200 amps of output. On 240 volts, it maxes out at around 160 amps. On 120 volts, it maxes out at around 120 amps and draws over 40 amps. What I did find interesting is that while the amperage output compared to the setting is obviously way off when the setting is maxed out, it doesn't behave like most other cheap welders where it just adjusts down linearly from there. On 240 volts, when set at 160 amps, you get around 160 amps. Adjusting higher than that simply does nothing. But when set below 160 amps, the output you get is relatively close to the setting. So the higher settings are bogus, but when set at, say, 80 amps, you do get roughly 80 amps. This behavior is the same on 120 volts, except that the amperage maxes out at around 120 instead of 160. So at least within the setting range it can actually achieve, the amp setting is relatively accurate. Both of these welders have functional hot start, but only when welding below max output. The ARC 200 has adjustable hot start, and I could easily catch its effect on my normal clamp meter. I still set up the scope, and there was clearly a brief period of increased amperage at the start. The hot start did make starting a rod slightly easier, but strangely I had a harder time starting 1 8 inch 7018 on this machine than I do on a lot of other cheap machines, even when it was set plenty hot for a 1 8 7018. It just really loved to stick the rod at the start. 3 32nd inch 7018 started much easier regardless of the amperage or hot start settings, so I wonder if the struggle was partly due to the thin aluminum welding cables. Maybe another time I'll test both of these welders with better cables and clamps to see if it makes a difference. The open circuit voltage on the ARC 200 is 98 volts, so that certainly isn't the issue. Neither of these welders do great with 6010, but they are better than some I've tried lately and the ARC 200 is the slightly better of the two. The ARC still goes out occasionally, it doesn't start all that easy, and it doesn't tolerate a long ARC, so it still isn't the machine that I would recommend if you need to run 6010. I think the MiG-130 is an interesting machine. I can't speak to long-term reliability, but it runs flux core reasonably well, even with the included flux core wire. It can stick weld okay with 332nd rods, and it has a very usable lift start TIG mode. 
Despite the quirks and poor quality cables, it could be an option worth consideration for someone on a tight budget, especially at the $150 price point I found it for. The ARC 200 is much less interesting and it annoys me quite a bit. It's pretty cheap, but ARC Captain sells a 160 amp version of this machine for about $40 less. But as we've seen, the ARC 200 is a 160 amp machine. I haven't tested the 160 amp version to see if it meets its claims, but it looks identical and I can't help but think that the ARC 200 is the exact same machine, but with a display programmed to look like it goes higher so they can charge more. It feels scammy and anyone who paid extra to get the 200 amp version because they had use for the higher output is going to be extra disappointed. Combine that with the fact that both of these welders claim UL listing, which is false. The company claims CSA certification of their welders, which is false. And I'm going to call out our captain just as I did Yes Welder. If you want to claim that you're better than Yes Welder, then be better. I'm just tired of these false claims. I did get a reply from Arc Captain to my email question about UL listing and CSA certification. In that email, I mentioned that I had just purchased a welder. They thanked me and asked me where I bought it so they could verify the purchase and send me free gifts. I ignored that request just like they completely ignored the main point of my email, which was the question about UL and CSA. I've also gotten at least two more emails from them since then asking me and a host of other YouTube channels to review their welders, offering free gifts to the reviewers and offering free stuff to the channel viewers for anyone who agrees to make videos. So clearly they are starting to push these welders really hard and offering free stuff right and left for positive reviews. Just be aware that they are no different than a lot of the other companies out there. Some of their machines may be okay for the money, but you have to weigh whether you want to give your money to a company that lies about industry certification and testing, has false claims about specs, and clearly creates versions of at least one of their models with intentionally, artificially inflated specs so they can charge a premium for added performance that you aren't getting. I don't know why this kind of behavior is suddenly so accepted. Sure, the machines are cheap, but be cheap and be truthful. Those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. If you'd like to see any additional or specific testing with either of these welders, let me know. As always, thanks for watching. Take care.